Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to go over how to do Ethernet through a fiber optic transceiver module. Now, in some of our recent videos, we've been looking at how to set up a PCB for Ethernet routing, as well as how some of the components that are used in the Ethernet link work. So far, we've looked at Ethernet over copper, but what about Ethernet over fiber? Well, it may seem like it's a lot more advanced, but frankly, it's actually a lot easier to do this over fiber than it is over copper. So I'm gonna run over how SFP connectors work and how to route into these connectors, as well as how to place them on your PCB because that is the first step to creating an ethernet link that operates over fiber. Make sure to hop into All Team Designer and follow along. Now, so far in some of our earlier videos, we've been talking about Ethernet and specifically Ethernet over copper cabling. But when you want to go to much higher speeds, everything is going to be done over fiber. And getting an Ethernet signal into an optical fiber requires a little transceiver module like this. These transceiver modules range from about $10 or $15 all the way up to thousands of dollars, depending on what speed they're operating at and what data rates they can support. These transceivers do not mount to the board directly. You have to actually use another component to get these transceivers onto your board. And that component is an SFP connector. So what do SFP connectors look like and how do they sit on a PCB? Here I have Octopart pulled up and one of the components that I have pulled up is this TE connectivity connector. So this is a standard SFP connector or small form factor pluggable connector. And basically this is the connector that you would use to hook into the back of one of these fiber optic transceiver modules. This connector doesn't normally appear on its own. Now you can use this connector on its own. However, typically you will see this connector come with a cage. So there will be a cage that sits around this fiber transceiver and then holds it in place. And one example of these cages is this Molex connector. This cage will sit around the SFP connector. Another example is this TE connectivity cage. This cage actually has a heat sink built into the top of it. That's actually very important because these little fiber modules can get pretty hot, especially if they're running at very high data rates. So the cage will already work as a heat sink, but some of these cages do have an additional heat sink on top of them. And then sometimes these cages also come ganged together like this other TE connectivity component. So just like you can buy blocks of RJ45 MagJack connectors all ganged into one block, so like a two by six block, you can also get SFP connectors that are ganged together like this connector shown here. So if you're going to use fiber for your ethernet link, what does the topology look like? And what do all the system layers look like? So normally when we have copper, we have some sort of host and the host has media access control built into it. This then routes to our phi interface or the physical layer interface. And then this routes out to our RJ45 and your RJ45 could be a mag jack, so it has the termination built into it. If it's not a mag jack, then we're going to have the term right here just before the RJ45. Now, with fiber, we essentially have the same thing, right? With fiber, we also have our host, and the host will have the Mac built into it. Then we go to an external phi. And then once we have this phi layer, this is where things start to change, because with fiber, the phi is just routed straight over to our SFP. We don't need any sort of termination here. The termination is generally on die or on module. So all you're doing is just routing straight into this SFP connector. What you will also see is you will also see sometimes the host has both the Mac and the phi built into it. So this might be the case, for example, if you're designing a system with, let's say, an FPGA. If you're using an FPGA, the MAC and the PHI could be built into the FPGA just because you're instantiating it as IP. Sometimes with switch controllers, so let's just say that this is a data center switch. If you're designing with a switch controller, the switch controller may have both the MAC and the PHI built into it. 
Some of these switch controllers will also support an external PHY, even if they have the PHY layer built in. So just as an example, let's say you've used up all your available ports for this switch controller. So then what you can actually do is route to an external or an expansion PHY chip, and then this PHY can then go to its own SFP connectors. So this topology that I've shown here basically just mirrors everything that you can do with copper. The only difference is that we've taken away the magnetics and we've taken away the RJ45, and we've just replaced it with our SFP connectors and then our transceiver module plugs directly into those SFP connectors. Now, one of the differences here is that you don't actually have power going to these RJ45s. If you do have power, it's usually just to turn on one of those LEDs. So you'll have an indicator LED that indicates when there's data flowing over the link. But the difference here with an SFP is that the SFP does require its own power because it has to trigger a photodiode and a diode laser in order to enable data communication over a fiber optic link. So it needs its own power brought in to the module. So the SFP connector also has to provide power. So that's the differences between the fiber topology and the copper topology. It really is just as simple as knocking out the copper interface replacing it with the fiber interface, and then bringing in power. So now that we've covered the topology and how these connections are made, I'm gonna show you how to actually put this into a PCB. Let's just suppose we want to use this TE connectivity SFP connector, and we're gonna use this Molex cage for an SFP cage. Now, one important point to note here is that there are different types of SFP connectors. So here, we're just using a standard 20-pin connector that would work with this particular fiber optic transceiver module. However, there are also 28 pin connectors, so that's an SFP28. There are also QSFP, SFP+, and there are a few different other variations. So keep that in mind if you just start searching for SFP connectors because those have to be matched up with particular modules. However, for like 10G or 28G ethernet, this is going to be the one that you'll use, which is a 20 pin connector. So now what I wanna do is just show you how to use the 20 pin SFP connector for this type of module in a PCB. So let's copy this part number over here in Altium Designer. And you can see here, I've actually already got an SFP cage pulled up. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this. One of the nice things about these components is you can see here, it actually marks where the board edge should be. And it's right there with that little white line you can see in this layer. And in fact, if I put this into 3D and I just rotate it a little bit, you can already see with this model that this is the location where the module will then slide in inside of this connector cage. So next thing, we wanna actually get the SFP connector itself. So I'm just gonna search this part number. We actually got a similar part number here from TE Connectivity. So you just wanna make sure that whatever part number you're using is compatible with the speed your interface needs to run at. Now once I grab this, I can go ahead and place it in the PCB. And if I drag this into the cage, you'll notice that it needs to sit just right inside of this cage. This location here is actually drawn up in a drawing for these part numbers. So if I just go to the data sheet, I'll be able to see a mechanical drawing inside of the data sheet that shows where that connector needs to sit. And you can see it's right here on this second page. So here on this second page, there's just a slight offset between these through-hole pins on the SFP connector and then this third pin on the cage. So if I go in here, I could actually then just set that distance between this mounting hole right here, MH1, and then pin six. So this would need to be set back just a little bit, I think. So make sure to check that in the data sheet when you're putting this SFP cage around one of these, these SFP connectors. That's what's gonna make sure that the edge of this module sits flush against this cage, and then it can also poke through the enclosure just the right amount so that you can access this and then plug fiber optic cables into it. So that's really as simple as it needs to be for placement of the cage and the connector. So the next question, how do we route into this? Well, here I have an example pulled up in a project. And in this project, you actually see here, I don't have the cage on this connector. Now, like I said earlier, you don't have to use a cage with these connectors. There are reasons to do it, but it's not required. You can just plug one of these modules directly into this connector. Now here on this connector, you will see here if I zoom in, I've got my RX lines on one side 
and my TX lines on the other side. These are routed as differential pairs, just as we would expect. And this board uses an FPGA. And now if I go down to L6, you can see exactly where these lines come into the inner layer, and then they go back over to our BGA for our FPGA. And that's exactly how it works. So you would route these differential pairs just like you would route any other set of differential pairs, and then you would route them up to the top layer so that they can hit that SFP. The last point to note here is that we brought in power rails here so that we can power this module up to the required logic level. And that is 3.3 volts, as you can see right here on this rail and this rail. You need to bring in stable power, and that means you need to, of course, follow best design guidelines for PDN design to ensure low impedance power throughout your required bandwidth. So to help you learn more about these design guidelines, I've compiled some blogs on resources.altium.com and I've linked to those in the description. Make sure to check out those links and learn more about how to work with these interfaces and these components. In an upcoming project, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of our old ethernet switches for a legacy design, and we're actually gonna add SFP connectors to it so we can use fiber modules just like this for our ethernet switch in office. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Make sure to subscribe and tune in and watch that upcoming video. Thanks again for watching everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and of course, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, whenever you wanna do these types of designs, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.